Give me just a second. I'm going to set this up. All right. Okay. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Today is Thursday, so it's Jordan Peterson Thursday. Uh, so, firstly, I want to tell you that uh, you know today is the final, uh, final, in the final one in the series of uh, the book uh, 12 Rules for Life. And we are starting his series on personality and its transformations. We'll be doing seven of those lectures, selected lectures, which worked really, really well in our New York in-person meetup. And then we are going to go into maps of meaning in great amount of detail. So we'll have both videos and the book. Uh, you can choose to look at, you know, read the book and the videos or just the videos or nothing or just come with your ideas and we'll have a great conversation. So uh, this has been a great community. Um, great people show up from all over the US and the world, apparently from New Delhi now. So uh, it's wonderful. Um, so, uh, so today we are going to be discussing CODA, which is my favorite chapter of this book. And uh, Roger and Claire have been leading this, uh, this Thursday, Jordan Peterson Thursdays amazingly well. And um, I just, they're, they're very different styles, but they work well, very well together. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Roger and Claire. Go ahead. At this time, I'm, the panel, I'm, I'm a panelist. Uh, if you want to be panelist on any of the meetups, you're welcome to do that. You just send me a message and you can be a panelist. All right. So today I'm, I'm, I'm one of the panelists. So over to you, Roger and Claire. All right, perfect. Thank you, Shrikant. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening. So as Shrikant mentioned, we'll be covering the CODA for the 12 Rules for Life book. This is kind of the final anecdote that Pearson gives. And it's an anecdote that's quite powerful because he brings together all the different rules and kind of puts them into context as to why they're really useful for answering some of the most important questions that are in life. And he starts by giving us a a real quick short story about him being on a trip with a friend in 2016. And he recounts that he, uh, he notices his friend has a pen and the pen is LED equipped. So Peterson chuckles to himself. He's like, huh, it's a pen of light. And then he, you know, later starts to kind of, kind of gets fixated on that symbol of a pen of light and asks his friend if, you know, he would mind giving it to him as a gift because he would like to write some things. And his friend, you know, gives him, gives him the pen. And Peterson thinks to himself in, in a serious way, in a Jungian way, but in a serious way, what shall I do with my newfound pen of light, right? What, what illuminating words should I write with this? And he engages in what Peterson explains as can be conceptualized as prayer, which I think is a pretty clever and cool way of thinking about it. And the idea is that Perhaps maybe when we think about prayer and we're asking for God or guidance or anything, it's not actually the almighty God itself, but rather yourself that actually answers. And he also puts this in a secular sense of there's, you know, this other you that seems to know a lot of answers that you yourself don't actually know. And a lot of times when you're faced with difficulties or when you're faced with hard problems, if you actually want to know the answer, and if you're willing to admit that you are that you likely are wrong and you likely have to change in some way, if you ask yourself a question, you would, an answer will appear. And it's kind of the same place where all new thoughts appear. It's this idea of you can have thoughts that surprise you. And that's essentially what Peterson engages in. Um, and so he goes through about 30 different questions of varying types of degrees. Um, if you would like to read all of them, I suggest you just read the book because we're not going to be able to get through all of them. But what me and Claire would like to do is go through a couple of questions and have everyone kind of share any thoughts that it invokes in you guys, any ideas or thoughts that emerge from yourselves in the same way that Peterson's kind of doing. And we'll also share Peterson's thoughts on a similar question. But the, uh, me and Claire have picked out a couple that we were really important to us. And Claire, did you, you, did you had the first yeah, ones, right? I mean, I just think elaborating on this pen of light is, is silly. And it's a, it's, it's so perfect that Peterson uses this metaphor because it shows how he likes to explain things, which is with like this silly actual object that seems really trite, but this very 
depth of meaning. And so if you think of this like gadget of a pen and it's probably one of those clicky pens, but you click it three times and a light comes out and he kind of has this profound moment that, okay, this is a silly gadget, but, but look at what it's doing. It is both illuminating what it points at and what it writes at. And then it is putting word down. It is putting thoughts into words. And so this kind of dual component of both shining at that which needs to be processed, that which needs to be write, written about, that is the prayer that he's gonna kind of take us through in the rest of this chapter. It's a, it's a guided meditation, it's a, a free writing, Roger was saying earlier, it's a free write or like rapid, uh, you know, just letting your, your brain um, move forward, but that pen of light is, is really poignant. Um, he uses another quick story before he goes into the questions about him and his wife, Tammy, and that they have sort of an unspoken agreement that if they are to ever get into a heated argument, um, something that needs diffusing, that they have a rule to take some space, go into two separate rooms and like come up with how they had contributed to the situation they were arguing about. So what had they done to make things worse? And I think that little story is an ex a perfect example of they shown that, show, showed that light on that which you can control, which for Peterson really is only yourself. And then coming back together with that, with that person that you relate with, the other in, in the world, and articulating or writing that which we showed shown the light on. And so um, this is sort of the practice that he takes us through in this chapter. And I think what we're going to try to do, as Roger's saying, is, is go through that together. I think we've developed kind of, we know each other now, we've spent 12 weeks together, um, and start to kind of go through this meditation um, as a group. Yeah, and I also want to highlight the just how the cool idea between that of having as a couple having a fight and then having to, the only way that you guys come back to agree is if you're coming with the mistakes that you had and what that kind of signals to both parties is this idea of like look here's where i know i messed up i'm willing to admit that if we can find a solution right like it's it's a tr it's an exchange of here's my shortcomings how can i fix that and peterson kind of then turns that into well you can do that with yourself too and i think that's a really beautiful idea. So Shrikant, did you? Yes, uh, I love this metaphor of pen of light, light, because what it is that, you know, we don't know a lot. I mean, we, you know, we, we are kind of, we are limited beings. Our consciousness is limited. World is very large and our own psyche is very large. So there is mostly darkness. And we have this ability to focus and language is our tool of paying attention and trying to achieve clarity and knowledge in the midst of darkness. So, I mean, biblically, you know, it's the word that brings the light. It is, you know, everything is chaos and you are, you are actually building order word by word, or, or more precisely, sentence by sentence. Um, and that is captured in this metaphor of pen of light, because it is those words, and particularly writing, because writing is self-reflective thinking. So you're writing it and you're looking at it. It is illuminated. You're paying attention to every word you're putting down. You're measuring, you're weighing everything and you are reacting to that. Um, and that's all that you're focused on in the midst of darkness. Um, so I think it captures the human condition uh, very well. Uh, the other thing I really love about this chapter is questions and what good questions can do. More than answers, it's the questions that really shape us. And to be asking fundamental questions, deep questions, without regard to how they are going to make you feel. And then just letting the answer emerge and look at it is a very profound way of discovering yourself, of projecting what you want to do, achieving clarity on what you want to do, 
um, figuring out what your values really are. So this combination of this metaphor of the pen of light and the actual tool of a series of deep, honest, profoundly simple, but profoundly important questions. I think that's, that's what makes this chapter uh, my favorite chapter in this book. Let's ask some of them. All right, so what I'm going to do folks is um, I'm going to be uh, the moderator as always. And what we want to do, what, you know, I discussed this with um, Roger and Claire. Um, we've been together, we've been going through this course for 13 weeks and we want to give a much greater chance for us to interact. So I'm going to pose the questions and anybody who wants is welcome to answer it. I just want to tell you that we record these and we post it on YouTube. So you're, you know, feel free to keep your video on or off. You can put your name, whatever you, whatever you want, uh, or you can participate in chat, whatever you prefer and anything you choose. Um, and what we will do is that, so we will go through a bunch of questions um, and see the whole range of answers. Because one of the great things about this particular meetup is all these people show up and they have a very open exchange and learn so much from each other. So that's what we're going to do for, uh, with these questions as the background. We've selected, you know, Roger and Claire have selected a bunch of questions from that. So we'll be going through them one by one. Um, and then after the questions uh, period, um, we're going to go into breakout rooms. And because this is the final in the series, we're going to do like a social version of the breakout rooms. It's going to be one hour divided into 15 minutes each. And each 15 minutes, we will be reshuffling everybody into different, so you get to talk to everybody that you've been interacting with all these 12, um, 12 weeks. All right, so with that, let's start with questions. Um, so I will, I will start with one of the questions. Uh, the first one, which is the most dramatic one. What words do you want inscribed on your soul? The question is, what shall I do with my new found pen of light? And then he responds, write down the words that you want inscribed in your soul. Okay. So, so for me, I, I took that as this idea of telling the truth and embodying it. Right? The idea of if you can genuinely express how you view the world and what you believe and actually try your best to live up to the very thing you believe yourself, that is the best way to be from Peterson's perspective. It's the embodiment of the logos. It's the embodiment of the, you know, the creative spirit. Wonderful. So let me, uh, let me uh, talk about the rules. So we have the same rules that we use all the time. Type exclamation mark if you would like to answer a question uh, that we are discussing. Um, number two, uh, keep on topic, answer only that question. Number three, be brief. And number four, Feel free to disagree with anybody. Feel free to speak your mind, but do so courteously. All right. So uh, Joel says two things. Don't diminish when shared. Light and knowledge. Okay, wonderful. And if you want, you can type things into chat and one of us will read it out if, you, if that's what you would prefer. But um, so first question, what, what will you do with your newfound pen of light? Anybody, suppose you had this pen of light, what would you do with it? Claire, you want to get us started? Yeah, I think that this first, the first thing that I thought of reading this and especially those words inscribed on your soul, I think that that beckons to me like a, an, an image of a tattoo, right? What, what means enough to us that we're inscribing it on our flesh and, and on that which is truly us and being our soul. And um, I think for immediately 
that stresses me out and I think of legacy, right? What do I want to leave behind? What, what, it, what will this all stand for in the end? What does my soul really mean? And I think that I've come to learn, to, to think about that in terms of values. So, you know, I, I could inscribe so much on my soul. There are so many things that I love, um, but, but really coming to understand how I put those in a hierarchy and what do I really value more than the rest of the things, those are the things that, um, that I would write with my pen of life. For me, I have found writing to be the fundamental way of thinking. To me, it's like, that's just thinking on paper. Um, and it is far better than the thinking I can do in my head. So my answer, you know, what will I do with the pen of, right, uh, pen of light, right? my newfound pen of light? I would say I will write everything I care about and try to rewrite, rewrite, rewrite it until it serves as a beacon uh, for me. Uh, Mamta, go ahead. Hi, so I love to write, and, but I love to write with consciousness. It's like when there is this, oh, an urge to write, you know, and I just can't stop myself. And uh, with uh, earlier, I used to question myself and then I would get the answer by evening or a day or two or some sign. But now what I do with pen of life, whenever I have a question, I jot it down and I get the answer. I get, I write the answer also. And with writing, a few of the stories that I have written uh, one of the dilemma that I faced was most of the time what I write comes true. So I became fearful of that, but then that's a superpower also. Mm -hmm. So I use it nicely. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is writing is my superpower, as you say. Thank you. It, Thank you. Wonderful. It saves me. Thank you. I mean, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mamata. Uh, next, uh, next up is Joe. Joe, go ahead. I mean, with a pen of light, I would want to capture the most uh, or the best in humanity. I mean, in order, because I think we have such a bias towards all the negative things that go on in the world that a pen of light would actually kind of capture, my pen of light anyway, would kind of capture the best of what humanity has to offer. And I think that that would be a way of bringing out the best in others. And one of my favorite sayings is, uh, seek always to bring out the best in others, thereby bringing out the best in oneself. And, and I think that that to me, a pen of light would allow me to actually accomplish that. If now, I got a lot of work on my writing to do, but so <laughs> other than that, though, uh, I do need that pen. So wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, anybody else wants to answer the question? What would you do with your newfound pen of light? I think Kaya King has an answer. Uh, Kaya King, go ahead. You have to unmute. I think this is a timely question because of COVID. I've actually had to think about a will. I never thought about something like that before. And uh, what my legacy will be. So um, in terms of the coda and what I would like my memory to be, I've said I would like to have uh, lived with integrity. I loved and was loved and try to contribute and improve the world. Thank you. Thank you, Kaya King. Next up is Gwen. Gwen, go ahead. Um, I really liked the, what Claire said about the legacy and the values we have. And 
I think what I would do is, is actually um, go back to this idea and, and share what matters to me. And, and I think um, one thing that Jordan Peterson as well is often mentioning is um, just do the right thing. So I think I would, I would use that pen to actually, um, as a guide, as, you know, as, as a way to remind ourselves what, what makes us do the right thing, what makes us be a good person. So, so it, I think in my case, it would be like um, just a list of adjectives, for example, like, like um, humility, um, being honest, being true. And, and I think these are, these are things that matter to me because this is what I have associated as, as the right values. Um, but I, I do understand that this actually brings another question, which again, Jordan Peterson has mentioned a few times, what happens if your values are wrong? And I think it's a, it's a big topic, but um, in my case, it would mean, like for me, it would mean doing some some true research, which might be either meditation or, or just plain education and trying to understand what, what makes someone do the right thing and what are the right values. And, and that can be very different from the society we live in and the context and the surroundings. Um, but I think this is what I would try to aim for. Thank you, thank you, Gwen. It's beautiful. Uh, next up uh, was uh, Pegor. Pegor says, I would stab the dragon of chaos in, in the eye with my pen of light. <laughs> it was wonderful. Um, all right, let's go to the next question. I'm going to pick, I'm going to pick the next one. Um, Roger, if you could pick the one after that and Claire, if you could pick one after that. So I'm going to pick this one. Um, what shall I do with the world? Seb, go ahead. Sebastian. Hi. Um, I, I just saw the uh, um, uh, Pega has this very interesting um, uh, idea. It says, he says, I would stab the dragon of chaos and I, and I with my pen of lights. So um, I, I have a question about this. If you if you stab the dragon of a chaos in the eye with your, with your pen of light, if you slay the dragon, do you become the dragon? Um, what happens is that dragon of chaos is like a hydra. Uh, you, can, you have to keep stabbing it. That's the way in which you cut off one head. It, of course, there are more heads that, that grow. Uh, so, it, I mean, the, the, uh, the idea of order and chaos is very deep in Jordan Peterson. So it's yeah. a question of, you know, it's, it's, you know, stabbing the dragon of chaos is basically stepping across the border of order for you into chaos, defeating chaos and thereby extending the order. So you're kind of reordering of chaos. Now there will still be dragon and you will still have to continue doing that, but absolutely. Uh, next one is Aaron. In terms of like uh, fighting the world, I, I, I see it as like, I see like your experience in the world is like a constant fight and it's a constant fight to do good and sort of battle the things that are broken about our society. So I think that the way that you fundamentally interact is, is that you're engaged in, in a battle to constantly do good and to help others and bring sunshine into their life. But then at the same time, advocate for the things that are messed up and that you need to fix. So I, I kind of see this as a constant struggle. That's, that's, that's the world that I'm interacting with. Thank you, Aaron. Um, anybody else? Uh, Roger and, or Claire, would you like to answer the question, what shall I do with the world? Yeah, so for me, I, I kind of like uh, this idea of act within the world as though the existence you're living is worth, worth playing out, right? Worth living. Um, and it's, it's a little bit similar to Peterson's idea of uh, 
I think for him, he answers, conduct myself as if being is more valuable than non-being. So like playing the game with the one assumption being that the game is worth playing, right? Um, but I, I really like that perspective as a full kind of first principle to taking on reality and existence as a whole. Claire? Yeah, I think the tendency in this question, or at least mine was for a long time, is to fix it, right? To heal it, to save it, to be some sort of a third party savior. Um, and, and Peterson's point here is quite the opposite. I mean, my, my take on this is, I, you know, when I think of world, I think of just the people of the world. So um, what I want to do is I want to explore the world together with people, um, have the conversation, you know, very open conversation. And I think that is the thing that will repair the world. That is the thing that will heal the world. That is the thing that is a lot of, a lot of the pain of the world is unnecessary it is based on just fear of each other and not willing to actually show who you are and actually connect to other. Go ahead. Claire. I think that's such an important point. And there's also so much unnecessary fear right in your own little world, you know, and that doesn't need to be this giant amount of pain, but, um, but alleviating what little you can in every moment is so worthwhile. Next up is uh, John. John, go ahead. Yeah, I feel like it's a pretty big question, um, of course. And um, yeah, I used to be sort of of the mindset like, oh, we need to fix the world or we need to change the world. Um, but uh, now I'm sort of more of the disposition that the world sort of is the way it is and we can do things within the world, but trying to change the world often just leaves us very frustrated and Many times if we do su succeed in, in changing the world, often the people who do that don't change it for the better. So I found myself, usually, most of the time, the thing I try to do is just observe the world and, and become more attuned to it. And that often can help in a lot of ways that otherwise causes a lot of frustration. Beautiful. Um Roger and Claire, this is going very well. There are so many people who are speaking, so many people putting things in chat. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to give preference to people who are typing exclamation mark, who want to speak, but uh, periodically I will keep reading everything. So everything that you type in, I will go ahead and read it out for you, but I will do it in the order so that it will be going back and forth between people speaking and reading out. So Pegar says, I would try to repair the world. And David Johnson says, fix myself to serve as an exemplar to the world. Next up is Joe. Yeah, I want to echo the idea of fixing uh, oneself first. And then that speaks to the idea of uh, putting your own house in order before you go out and change the world. And I really think that that's a really important point. But there is one, the very last line in this uh, last uh, chapter um, was I, I thought was profound and it was you know I wish you all the best and hope that you can wish the best for others and the reason why I think that that is so important is it really speaks to what it means to be a friend and to me if you really want to change the world you're just a friend and a person and, and a, to whomever you're interacting with and that means being honest not lying and abiding by as many of those rules that he spoke to throughout the book. And I think that that's where um, in, you don't set out to change the world. You can only change what is in your, you know, in, in, what is in your world, of, what, what's possible. And I think in, but it, focusing on yourself and not focusing on others, I think is a critical part of that process. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Stefan says, find the gold within the world and bring it back home, you get to define what gold is. Next up is Aaron. Uh, yeah, no, a really good point, Joe, about, you know, changing the world doesn't have to be, uh, you know, like, like completely just, you know, saving the environment in one fell swoop, just being a good neighbor, or being a good friend is enough. I do want to comment on something that Jonathan said about 
being an observer and not really engaging. I feel like Jonathan, you have to engage, even if it's at the level that Joe is talking about, about being a good neighbor or, or, or just being um, a friend, like a, like keeping your word, keeping your appointments, because I've been in the observer seat before and life gets really depressing. Like I think like life, like you, we like to think that we are these like external things that can just like watch life as a movie, but you can't watch life as a television show. You are in the TV show and you need to act. And again, it doesn't have to be on this like grandiose scale of, of, of fighting some war or changing the world. It could be on the micro level of like, I'm going to be, 10% nicer to the people around me. But I think if you just sit back as an observer, life gets really depressing. Uh, John, go ahead. Yeah, well, I think maybe my, my meaning of what I said was not really didn't come across. Um, when I mean observe, I mean take in what's going on around you in the moment. You know, you could see your neighbor and you could say hello without even seeing them. And are you really saying hello to them? So when I say observe, I mean take in the world fully. And the more fully you take in the world, the more in tune you are with reality and, and the better you are able to act. So it's not just observe the world and do nothing, but it's observe the world before you act because you're better off if you know where you are before you go somewhere. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, Gwen says, I would try to bring more education to the people of the world. Education seems to me to bring the ability to make decisions and take responsibility for your life. Next up is Dave. Ooh, uh, thanks, Rakan. Uh, this discussion reminded me of a, a very inspirational quotation I saw years ago. If I save one person, I save the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Roger says, change the part of the world that you are. Very good. And uh, Chachi says, I would write on my soul. Maybe you can't change the world, but you can, ch you can change my world. Wonderful. All right. Uh, let me see. Anybody else? Uh, Mamta, go ahead. Oh, you have typed something. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, there is like too much struggle for me. Uh, words have power. And I think I have realized that power. So for me, I become very picky when it comes to speaking words and sentences and phrases and writing, of course. Uh -huh. But... One thing is, uh, thoughtlessness has its own pleasure. Okay. And uh, that's why I would be like emptying my mind or be an empty slate so that I can write more. Okay, thank that's you. Right. Thank, thank you, Mamta. Uh, next up is uh, Lisa. Lisa says, what would you write on your soul Clarity before action. Okay, wonderful. Next question is from Roger. Roger, can you go ahead and pose your question? Yeah, the, the, the next question is, and I think it's pretty relevant to right now, is what shall I do with a torn, a torn nation? Wow. Um, okay, I, I'll, I'll start by answering it. Uh, Claire, you can go next, and then... By that time, uh, you know, folks, you can go ahead and either type your answer or you can type a exclamation mark so that you can speak. Um, I, I mean, my solution, I think, is just talk, mm -hmm. talk to each other, you know, develop a process. I mean, I, for me, it's like do these meetups, you know, do these meetups on as large a scale to engage anybody who wants to engage in a deep conversation with other people. Um, and I think that's, fun that's fundamentally what you can do to Terra because the, the tearing, why is the nation torn? Um, because people actually do not see each other at all. They are just, you know, and they're just kind of talking within their own little groups 
without seeing the other group and they're seeing the other group as the other without actually seeing there are profound similarities between them and they are not even seeing that. So I think that so conversation is, is I think what the solution. Uh, so we have got uh, Claire, Roger, Daniel and Aaron next. Uh, San, uh, sorry, Sanjay, Sanjay, go ahead. Am I next? Yes, you're next. And then uh, Claire uh, after that. Okay, so um, yeah, I, I would, um, um, I mean, there's some people that I know who um, are very, uh, have very different views politically than I do. And so I would find people like that and basically talk to them, not about politics or anything controversial, but basically let them know that I am human, that I'm a person who cares about the same things they care about, basically build a connection with them um, to show them that, you know, we, we're not this, uh, you know, bipartisan world or country that we're all made of people and we all share basically the same goals. Um, it, you know, and, and try, I would, I would definitely not go into political issues or things that would be heated. I would basically try to show them that, um, you know, we need to look at each other first as, as people, as people who they should, we should all value. Thank you. Um, next up is Claire, followed by Roger and Daniel. I'll pass. Thank you. I said this. Okay. One. Uh, Roger, Daniel, and Aaron. Yeah, for me, uh, maybe I, I feel it's the exact opposite of Sanjay's. I directly engage with uh, very controversial topics, but mostly, first and foremost, attempting to understand their perspective. Um, the assumption that, assuming that I don't actually know what I'm talking about, and that more than likely, I even if the person seems completely wrong and ignorant and all other the, all the other pejoratives you can throw at someone assume that they're rational people that likely believe something um that's at least semi-rational that makes sense within their view and i always like to approach those kinds of situations with the idea that if what they're saying sounds stupid more than likely it's me who just hasn't understood the argument right so i, I think just kind of that sense really can help people see each other as human. Next up is Daniel, Aaron, Joe, and John. Daniel, go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, when I heard you, Shrikant, talk about uh, just talking, at first I thought, well, this seems a little too simple almost. And all, all we got to do is talk. But then I thought about it and I realized, well, it kind of reminds me of Hegel's dialectic about thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, which to kind of break it down is, well, you say something, and then I say something, and then we put it together. And then no matter what, we're better off than we were before because we've engaged with something that's different than us. And I thought, okay, well, really, when you break it down, that could work. So I thought that was really interesting to hear. And, you know, I'm here at a meetup doing this kind of thing. No matter what comes out of it, I'm better off than I was before. Um, but the question that I kind of put the exclamation point down for was to ask about, well, what do we do with the Torn Nation? I'm kind of interested in what the group thinks about do we need to do something with the Torn Nation? Do we have a that's responsibility? What, that's do we what have each an person is answering. Yeah, do we, do we have like an ethical responsibility to do something with this Torn Nation? And if we don't do something with this Torn Nation, are we therefore a bad person or an apathetic person? Or, you know, do we have a duty to do this thing? And okay. yeah, I mean, okay. if, if that's, that's kind of what I'm interested to keep listening about, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. Uh, next up is Aaron, Joel, and Jonathan. You know, I kind of actually agree with Sanjay on this one in the sense that I want to view every person, and I think this could help bring the country back together, view everybody as having a baseline level of decency. And I think that once you start doing that, once you see that everyone has a baseline level of decency, no matter how convoluted or crazy their ideas are, that allows you to engage with them in a much more productive and loving and friendly way. Uh, that's, not, that, that's not to say I'm gonna keep my mouth shut for the entire discussion, but if I constantly say, okay, this person wants the best for the world, they want the best for the world, they want the best for the world, but we're just not seeing eye to eye, maybe they're right, maybe I'm wrong, or maybe it's the other way around, or maybe we can somewhere meet somewhere in the middle, but I think maintaining that baseline decency about about that other person is going to help tremendously. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Uh, next up uh, is, so <clears throat> Chachi says knit one and crochet two. 
to weave the social fabric. Next up is uh, Joe, John, and Pegor. Joe, go ahead. I mean, I agree with both uh, Roger and Sanjay. And I think that the idea of humanization is critical into any kind of dialogue. But I think you also can't skate around the issues that confront us. And in that process, another aspect of this last chapter that I really did like was you don't get peace by being right. And the idea that even, you know, what, it, what does it really mean to be right? It, it's, it, there's nothing, there's no mutual benefit if you're, all you're doing is you want the other person to be wrong. And I think that's where humanization kind of comes into this process. And I think also something that was really stuck with me, and I think perhaps the best lesson that I'd taken from uh, one of the answers that Roger had given me, I forget which rule it was, was to why there's such a divide is that when we say the other side is right about something, and it was something about economic dialogue, I forget what my exact question was, but Roger answered it and said, if we have this, um, if we admit that we're wrong about something, that then it challenges everything else that we may believe about ourselves. And I think that's an important point when you're talking about healing, because you have to know that the other person's hurting. And that's why being right really doesn't matter. It's about being, you know, uh, both human and you know, coming to a common agreement, so. Thank you, Joel. Uh, next up is uh, John. John, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different tack on this and sort of go in the vein of cleaning your own room before you uh, engage with the world. Um, so I'm gonna share something that I wrote about this actually recently, which was um, to be wary of consuming packaged worldviews that affirm your pre-held beliefs and convictions. That goes, uh, for people who consider themselves conservatives as well as liberals. Issues that are divisive are always multifaceted and impossible to reduce to simple solutions. Are you consuming information or conclusions? Are you deliberating or rooting? Always be willing to consider another point of view based on facts and give room for others to do the same. Being wrong could be a, be a great gift if you are willing to do the unpleasant thing and admit it. Uh, and Voltaire once said, Cherish those who seek the truth, but beware of those who find it. Thank you, John. Uh, next up is uh, Pegor. Pegor, go ahead. Yeah, uh, for me, like, uh, I'd go back to what you mentioned earlier about Peterson, that uh, as, as a member of a torn nation, I would admit to how I participated in the tearing apart of that nation, because what is a nation but an extended family? Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, I just want to say that, you know, our meetups, I've been running these meetups in New York City for the past four and a half years. In New York, you get people from every background, uh, every country. Uh, we get people from the left, people from the right. We get people who are atheists, people who are religious. And the thing, what happens is that once the principle is established of respect for each other, honesty in stating your position and kind of courtesy of listening and speaking both ways, you know, something magical happens because then actually most people who come who are on the left, you know, kind of dislike their own like left side because they, they don't think that they speak enough uh, to other people or listen enough to other people. Uh, and the same with the right, and, right. So it's like, it's people, it's kind of independent thinkers, you know, this, this, the smallest minority is that of an individual. And if you respect the individual, and if you deal with people as individuals and actually try to see and hear what they're saying and try to speak to them from as an individual, I think, oh, you know, something magical happens. So that, that's, that's my take. Let me see, uh, Claire, you get to ask the next question. I'm gonna skip around a little bit. Um, next question is, what shall I do with the fact of aging? All right, who wants to go next? Who wants to answer? You can go ahead and type an exclamation mark or you can type it out. 
So uh, Claire and Roger are going to alternate asking questions. Okay, so we start with Joe. Joe, go ahead. Mine's gonna be uh, very short and sweet on this. It's you should embrace it. I mean, you know, there's, if you resist it, it's gonna be, you know, uh, you're really going to just end up hurting yourself. So I think embracing it and, you know, you try and, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it there. Actually. I'm not going to go too much to detail. Uh, Lisa, you're next uh, for Lisa, Roger and Sanjay. That was my answer too. embrace it. Enjoy it. Enjoy the ride. Thank you. Uh, next up is Roger, Sanjay and Aaron. Yeah, mine is uh, write a st try to write a story well enough that its ending is well deserved. That the fact that it's coming more to more to a close every day, it's a well deserved ending. Thank you, uh, Roger. Next up is Sanjay. I would um, try to help um, people around me to to see the good in aging, um, not just in in our own uh, aging process, but also um, realize that people who are senior, um, oftentimes we see them as we don't value them, basically show them that um, they have a lot of value. I mean, I have kids and um, I have started to see the value of grandparents for, for grandchildren. Um, grandparents are able to do things uh, parents cannot do, adults cannot do. So I think there's a lot of power in that. Thank you, Sanjay. Next up is uh, Maxine, Aaron, and Deborah. Maxine, go ahead. What should I do with aging? I would ignore it. I, <laughs> I, I don't believe age, age is just a number. Just go on with your life and stop worrying about aging or there won't be any more to your life. You have to just move forward and just move forward like everybody else. Keep your mind going, keep your body going, keep everything moving. Because once you stand still, that's it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Maxine. Next up is Aaron and Deborah. Yeah, um, obviously, I probably have a lot of aging more to do. But I, I will say this, I think that as you get older, it's really good to start diversifying your interest a little bit. So if you're a very physical person, and you put all of your stock on being healthy, and, th and this is like experience I have taking care of like older people, if your identity is 100% defined in the body, then when you get older, you're going to have a really rough go of it because you're going to be like, oh my God, I, I can't exercise the way I used to, or I don't look as beautiful as I once did. So I think as we get older, we owe it to ourselves to come up with different dimensions to our personalities so that when we are older and we don't quite look the same, we have other awesome things going for us that, that make people want to come to us. So Again, who knows what I'll be like when I'm older, but that, that's just my two cents there. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Next up is Deborah. Deborah, go ahead. Okay, so Joe said to embrace, um, I guess, the age that you are, embrace aging in general. I think even beyond embracing the age you are, embrace your inner child, which is sort of the opposite. Everyone's like, oh, just you're going to get older. I don't think you have to act like your chronological age, though, in all things. Um, I feel like playing and being whimsical when you can will probably make you feel happier. And if you can keep your child like curiosity and be silly, like people like that. It's fun for you and it's infectious. And I feel like we should all do that when we can. Wonderful. Uh, Stefan says, keep your humor, laugh as much as you can. Next up is Chachi. Chachi, go ahead. Um, I think the older people get, the more I love them because... Um, I think when we see the unexpected and we see the youth in someone that we don't expect to see youth, it's, 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 it's extraordinary. So I, I just love hearing people's stories. And I think um, that's the blessing of getting older. You have more stories. Thank you, Joshi. Next up is Gwen. Gwen, go ahead. 
Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry. Yes. Um, I think I, I would really see that um, just time, generally speaking, in aging as um, a way to learn, reflect and practice. So what I mean by that is always this idea of trying to get to be a better version that you were yesterday, um, which, like I mentioned a bit earlier, I think it does come a lot through education and just understanding yourself better in the world you live in and the people that surround you. Um, and reflect, I feel like, whether it's through meditation or through truly taking the time to understand what what the ideas and concepts are that you're trying to, just like we're doing now, for example, um, and trying to see all the different perspectives. I think this is a major point, different perspectives. Thank you, uh, Gwen. Uh, it's next... not, oh, sorry. not one sided. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Um, you, you just cut out for, for a moment. Um, next up sorry. is uh, Stefan. Stefan, go ahead. Yes, so, um, so my grandparents, they're in their 80s and 90s. And my grandpa fought in World War II, and they've seen a bunch of highs and lows in life. And every single time I see them, they joke about dying. They always have a really good sense of humor about it. It's like, they're not scared in the least. And I think that's a really good way to look at it. Thank you. Uh, next up is Claire. Um, I just wanna, I think Peterson's line here is one that I've memorized. So I wanna say it, which is replace the potential of my youth with the accomplishments of my maturity. And I think the accomplishments of my maturity doesn't just mean, you know, career progression, right? Accomplishment really has to do with whatever those values are that you line up for yourself. So I think uh, that's a, a, a transition I've made in my life that I can look back each year and see, you know, compare myself to myself that year prior. And that is the most satisfying thing. So I think, you know, in a year you'll either have what you set out to do or an excuse for why you didn't. Um, and it always feels best, better if you do it. Thank you, uh, Claire. Next up is uh, John followed by Sanjay. John, go ahead. Yeah, um, so I, I think that, um, when aging, um, I think well, I forgot where I heard this quote, but there's something along the lines of, um, you know, if you're if if you're old, you're fortunate enough to have gotten old, you know, so you should be thankful that you sort of had that that the opportunity to live that long. Many people and many beings um, don't have that opportunity. In fact, you may not you may not live to be old. So, you know, if you're going to spend the time that you do have fretting about it. That's wasted time. So I feel like, and and I try as much as possible to prepare. You can prepare for becoming older or what looks like may happen, but I I feel like fretting about it just seems like um, not really a productive use of time. Thank you, John. Uh, kayaking. Did you have? Did you wanted to say some? Did you want to say something? Okay, next up is Sanjay. Yes, I oh, do. Yes. Go ahead, Sparky. I don't know how to press the, the communication button, you know, like I don't know how to use the, uh, the chat. Okay. So uh, if, I haven't been contributing, but anyway, I, um, aging I feel is a mental state and uh, think outside the box. Okay, so. thank you. Thank you. Um, if anybody notices kayaking raising the hand, go ahead and say kayaking has raised the hand in the chat. And I will, I will call on her. Uh, next up, uh, and thank you very much, Pegor, for pointing that out. Uh, next up is Sanjay. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, something else. I think, um, I mean, the, the fact that we're asking a question like this and we're pinpointing aging as a problem is itself a problem. Um, we, you know, there are more, um, and I'm, I, I know why Peterson put this in, but um, I think that that we shouldn't focus on um, a specific class of people and say that that there's a problem with uh, you know becoming that class of people. That's in effect what we're saying when we're saying that aging is is problematic. Thank you, uh, Sanjay. Uh, thank you very much. Next up is Roger, followed by Pegor. 
Yeah, just uh, bouncing off of Sanjay's point, because it did remind me of, one, I think, one of the stories that Pearson points out. And it's the, he's mentioned in this book several times that uh, there's arithmetic that everyone hates. And then he talks about arithmetic that he hates himself, that he's done, but he's done it before. Because he says, well, I normally only visit my parents around twice a year. And I know the direct life expectancy for somebody of their age. So I've done, you know, the unpleasant, you know, arithmetic of realizing that I probably will only see them 20 times more. And he points out that like, that's a horrible thing to know. But it's also a very important thing to know. Right? It makes the fact that it's an, that's a very limited supply. Each one of those is much more meaningful each time. So, but yeah, I, I, I do think that's, from my perspective, I interpret it as Peterson kind of just pointing out that aging is simply an indication of our time that we have left in existence and the time of this experience as a whole, rather than anything other than that. And it's just as, as a reality of life. Thank you, Roger. Next up is Pegor. Yeah, uh, off of what uh, Roger said, I think aging or more specifically mortality is what gives life meaning. Because if you're immortal, then you can just, there's no like once in a lifetime moments. Everything can happen more than once. Yeah, so. Thank you, Pegor. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm going to, uh, so Roger, you, you get to go to the next, uh, you know, choose the next question, but I'm going to, uh, see, my take is very, very different. Um, I learned this from Jacob Branowski. He did this series called Ascent of Man. And the final episode in that series is called The Long Childhood. And that's what really characterizes us human beings. We have long childhood. Our, we get born with only our half, half the brain developed. And then we grow outside in this world to, um, you know, to keep growing. He says in all the older traditional cultures, always they held ideal as adults. Uh, like, for example, if you look at um, Easter Island, those big statues is a classic example this kind of stony thing, which is the final, this is where you get finally if you do everything right, which is a static ideal. But what Jacob Bronowski is saying is that really the ideal is the child. And what you're trying to do is to achieve a long childhood. So when I look at all the people that I like, people like Leonardo da Vinci, people like Newton, as they grow older, they actually become more childlike. They become more curious. They're, they are more active in their mind. They are more open. They are less constrained by kind of social convention. They're focused on growing and they keep growing throughout their life. So I think the ideal, I agree with Brunowski, the ideal is the long childhood. And the longer the childhood you have, uh, the better. So that's how I look at aging. I think uh, like, for example, a friend of mine who is now around 90 in Chicago, he said to me, Shrikant, uh, you know, I asked him, I called him and said, how are you doing, uh, Nob? So he says, I'm doing, doing well, actually. So I said, what's your secret? You know, because he's 90 and he's still working and he's still full of energy, still doing all kinds of new projects. He says, Shrikant, it's very simple. Never, never retire. Do what you like and keep doing it. And that's it, you know? And so in that sense, they remain, he's, he's a child. And he's, he's more of a child than what he was younger because he has less things to be bothered about. He knows what is important and he's just focused on that. So that's, that's my, my take on this. Um, what's the next question, uh, Roger? Uh, so I picked this one because I feel it's really important, especially as, you know, we're kind of in scary times and, especially with Peterson's theme of, you know, the Nietzschean observation of the death of God and Jung's adaption of that problem. And since we're going to be covering maps of meaning here in a bit, I, I felt like I'd be really interested to start considering this idea of what shall I do with the enlightened one? The person that knows truth or the person that has acquired um, it. Can one of you type the question in, in the chat so people know it? So what shall I do with the enlightened one? Anybody? Yeah, how, how shall I deal with the enlightenment? Okay, so we'll start with Pegor. 
Yeah, I think like uh, there's a lot of mirrors of the enlightened one in current society. And I would remind the enlightened one that just because they're enlightened doesn't mean that they're better than everyone else. Okay, thank you, Pagor. Uh, next up is Sanjay. I think this is a, a pretty difficult one because the the concept of enlightened is so vague or difficult to to ascertain. Um, but given let's let's take the assumption that we know people who truly are enlightened, um, which is not easy. But let's let's assume that we do. Um, in that case, um, you know, I mean, it, it's almost like you know we want we should put them on a pedestal because that's really what enlightenment is about. Um, we should listen to them and we should uh, value their their ideas and 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 uh, opinion on things. Um, you know the challenge is, is finding truly who is enlightened, but let's say if we can then then definitely um, put them on a pedestal. Okay, next up is going to be Mamta followed by Joe, followed by Aaron. Mamta, please keep it short, okay? Go ahead. Okay, so basically, Enlightened souls, the previous one, uh, my question is, they haven't saved the word. So that's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mamta. Next up is Joe, Aaron, and Deborah. Um, I'm going to come back to something that I said a little bit earlier. It's just, uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily see putting, I, I'm going to disagree with a little bit with Sanjay with the idea of putting them up on a pedestal because uh, I don't think that's fair to them. And I think that the best thing to do with anybody, lightened or not, is be their friend and be honest with them and, and to be forthright with them. And I think that that would allow them to recognize that, that you know, they're not alone. And so I think that that's really the most, the best thing you could do for somebody enlightened or non-enlightened. Thank you, Joe. Next up is... Aaron, followed by Deborah. I, I think, you know, I, I don't know if it's possible to achieve full enlightenment, but I think we need to stop ignoring these people. Like, I think we have a lot of enlightened people that we kind of just think are very foolish and wasting their time. But in reality, they're actually doing the work and saying the things that actually matter. And we're not, e we're not even seeing them. So before we even put them on a pedestal, we need to just acknowledge that these people exist and, and sort of give them a little bit more of a platform in our own heads. And, and then once we're starting to listen to them, then we can think about even elevating them to some higher status. Next up is Deborah. Okay. Um, so I didn't read any of this. I'm kind of just going like off the cuff, but I would say to engage with that person, um, to learn from them, like other people were saying, but if they're truly enlightened, then like they would be open to learning from you too. I doubt they know everything there is to know in the world. So then you can have an exchange and that kind of rapport should be enlightening for both people. And then I would think you're connecting on an emotional as well as an intellectual level. And I would hope that we would aim for that. Kind of like Joe was saying with everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, next up is kayaking. Kayaking, go ahead. Um, I know some uh, Buddhist monks. I go to a monastery near me, and they never tell you that they have reached enlightenment. They're not allowed to. It's part of being modest. Um, but what do I do when I'm near these enlightened people? Um, they're joyful and good humor. Um, I try to show respect, and uh, I try to listen carefully. Thank you. Uh, next up is Roger, followed by John. Roger, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to mention Peterson's answer, just because I also think it's very interesting. Because he, he, he kind of repeats what a lot of people have already said. It's the idea of replace him with the truth seeker of enlightenment. The idea that how Peterson sees human psychology is a constant cyclical nature of, of, of updating you know, a system. So it's constantly you're never done learning and you're never done attaining new information. But it's this idea that there's never one singular state that is, that is the ultimate solution to the entire problem. Thank you, Roger. Next up is John. John, go ahead.
Uh, John, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, there's two ways, um, I guess you could approach this question. So there's a saying in Buddhism that if you meet the Buddha in the road, kill him. <laughs> um, or, uh, and basically it's, it's sort of warning against people who are, who are claiming they're enlightened, right? So we have uh, an entire, and you see this in the news, people claim they're enlightened and it comes out they sort of have done things that aren't decidedly unenlightened. Um, but if you were to meet um, a person who, who was enlightened, who you sense was enlightened, I would just say, ask him the questions that are curious to you and important and, and let him answer or her. Um, I feel there's no, you know, be in the moment with them and just try to sort of be connected with them. And I feel like that would be the best way that, that I, I would try to go about it. Uh, thank you, John. Claire, what's the next question? The next question is, what shall I do with a lying man? Wow. All right. What shall I do with a lying man? Anybody? Okay, start with Begor. Begor, go ahead. Yeah, so from my experience, stay away and just let the person be because uh, as Peterson mentions in one of his biblical talks, if, if you twist the fabric of reality, at some point it's going to twist back and slap you in the face. So just stay away because you don't want to be near that person when the slap comes, you know, so. Thank you. Our next up is Daniel, followed by Joe. Yeah, so I guess I come at this with a little bit more empathy, um, you know, as, as a teacher, I'm a, I'm a music teacher. And so one of the things I learned early on was if you see a student sleeping, you shouldn't be punishing the student for sleeping. You should be asking what is going on in the student's life that they feel they need to sleep in class. And if I come across somebody who I know is lying, I feel like I would want to, at least, you know, in my ideal hypothetical sense, want to say, why is this person lying? There must be a reason why this person is lying. I don't think anybody enjoys being a liar. Maybe they do. I'm not sure. But I guess that's, that's my initial reaction to it. I'd want to find out why are they lying and maybe I could do something for them or maybe I'm idealizing my hypothetical self a little bit too much. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Next up is uh, Joe followed by Sanjay. Well, Daniel actually just took exactly what I was going to say and I also wish he had been my teacher, but I do think that there's a certain level of understanding that needs to come in as to why somebody is lying. And there's also the idea of forgiving, but not forgetting. And I think that, you know, there has to be an element of justice when we're applying this to people that are lying. So um, it's to understand as to what their perspective is. And lying in and of itself is a very difficult thing to discern because just as truth is a very difficult thing to discern. So they may not even necessarily, they may, that means they're speaking out against them, what they actually believe. And in that case, I would try to understand as to why they feel that felt the need to do that. And I think that that's the most important thing because they're lying to you for a reason. And um, once you understand that, you could develop a certain level of empathy, which allows you to engage in more honest conversation. Thank you, Joe. Next up is uh, Sanjay. Yes, I, I agree with um, part of what Joe said. Um, I mean, I agree with all of it, but especially part of what he said that um, you have to um, make sure that, that they are truly lying um, and that uh, they're doing it, uh, that their uh, view of the world is, is accurate, that it's not, um, their lie is not composed of um, their misunderstanding or they're not knowing um, what they're saying. So once you know that they're actually lying, I would say that, um, you, know, you, you it, it's it's important for us to show them, not tell them, but show them that their lies are visible to others. Um, I think that's the most helpful thing you can do to someone is to show them that lying doesn't work. Thank you. Uh, thank, okay, all right. Um, Roger, you get the next question. And uh, yeah, for this one, what shall I do in the next dire moment? And I'll copy it. Excellent. What shall I do in the next dire moment? Roger. 
right? Who would like to go with that? You can go ahead and type exclamation mark. Joe, you're first. I mean, I think he kind of answered this with rule 12 is that, you know, you shorten the time frame and you just deal with the present moment as best you can. And I think that that's what you do in, in desperation is that, you know, you kind of, you just handle as much as you can and you, you know, minute by minute, 15 minutes, and then you just, you, you keep pushing forward um, because life is hard. Uh, and I also think that it's really important to have a way and a philosophy of life in this, you know, uh, construct as to how you're going to handle situations. So um, that's why stoicism resonates with me is how to handle, you know, what is in my control, what is not in my control, and then how to evaluate things rationally. While that may not work for everyone, I understand that. Um, but I think that having a philosophy of life is critical within that process. Thank you, Joe. Next up is Lisa, Roger, Claire, and Sanjay. Lisa, go ahead. Mine is also similar to Joe's. Um, I'll listen. Um, a, listen. B, place space and time between myself and an immediate solution by organizing my thoughts and actions. The space is filled with reflection and locating common perspective. And two, time allows for dis, um, dire moments to become less desire, less dire, excuse me. Thank you, Lisa. Next up is uh, Roger, Claire, and Sanjay. Yeah, for this one I had written, uh, build myself to be the person that I want to be when that moment mm. comes. Oh, so in other words, not, not just doing it, yeah, like not, not just building the patterns once it's already there, or thinking that you're going to be a certain person when mm -hmm. situations get real, but trying to always already be that right. so that when the situation pops up, you know. Yeah. So Claire, Bill, you're next. Yeah, I think dire moment now means something so much different for me, right? That it means it means in, in March when COVID hit, it means when if you live in the forest in California right now, it means if you live in Alabama right now, and I think I'm now thinking like, okay, what 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 I do if the nuke was coming? Like, what is that dire? What is that response? Um, and like, why did we all go get toilet paper? Like, surely that wasn't the most dire thing to be focusing on in that time. Um, and I think you guys hit it on the head here. I've never thought about it in this way, but like us, you you figuring out your value structure now and knowing yourself and strengthening yourself now helps you make better decisions when when things really go badly. Uh, thank you, Claire. Next up is Sanjay. Um, yeah, I think it uh, depends on what dire means. Um, if, if dire is referring to an immediate dangerous situation uh, for, for the people around me and for me, then, then I would take action to avoid it. But if, it, if it's referring to something that's not immediately dangerous, then I would continue on the path that I was on. Um, I would not let um, fear of that dire situation affect me. Um, you know, I mean, it, taking the... The stoic view um, we've you know we we learn to already think about things that are possible that could happen and we already think about we premeditate um, the direction that we would take in such situations so if you've already done that and we do run into a dire situation um, we do as we thought earlier we just continue on that path uh, thank you Sanjay uh, Daniel says this dire situation question reminds me of Peterson's goal of being the most reliable person at your father's funeral. Pegor says, be prepared, the scout motto. Uh, and Seb says, I happen to have had a couple of dire moments the past couple of months. I came to the realization that all you have to do is just sit down and breathe. Okay, um, anybody else? Uh, let me see. Uh, if that comes from the deepest corner of your soul, this is Louis. Um, then you must be aware of what's happening inside you and fear it and no fear it. Instead of that face, it will repeat over and again. Uh, Luis, do you want to clarify? I'm not sure I read it properly. If you want to clarify, you can go ahead and uh, just unmute yourself. Okay. Um, so there are a couple of, I, I would say uh, in one of the exercises that um, stoicism does is that it kind of, it's kind of, uh, the idea is that of premeditation 
kind of imagine yourself in a dire situation um, and kind of get used to it so that when it actually happens, you're, you're, you're kind of, you remain like a, you know, you have at least a core of stability in you from which you can act, uh, something like that. Um, Chachi says, it says then act, okay? Um, next question is from, whom is it by? Is it uh, Roger Stone? No, it, I think it's uh, me, right? Okay, go ahead, Claire. Oh man, they're so good at this stage. Uh, okay, I think I'm gonna go with, what shall I do when I ruin my rivers? I think um, I, put, I chose this one because Peterson does get cr criticized for not addressing environmental issues. And I think this is one time that he does speak to it. It's something that, that is top of mind today. Um, so what shall I do when I ruin my rivers? Okay, anybody? Sanjay. Um, I would try to recruit others to help fix it. Okay, anybody else? I, mean, I like uh, Peterson's answer. What, what does Peterson say? Do you have the answer with you? Yeah, he does. He says, seek for the living water and let it cleanse the earth. Um, and so he almost takes a psychological approach to this rather than a clearly sort of scientific one um, and, and into finding where there is living water, finding where there is a process to cleanse and letting, um, and if we put ourselves in order, perhaps we can do the same for our world. So it's sort of clean your room. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to make a point. This is uh, kind of a broader point. This is more about people. This is a point that Louis Sullivan makes. You know, what, what do you do when, you know, it's like if you ask the equivalent question, what do you do about a broken world, right? So his whole answer is that you kind of, um, I mean, the, the, uh, you know, when Jordan Peterson elaborates on this, he says, he says that, if you yourself start dealing with things clear, you know, cleanly with your own life, that kind of spreads out to other people. And that is the process. So it's like, it's a kind of, you know, you fix yourself, you deal with other people honestly. So it's kind of like inside out process instead, instead of being outside in. Um, so that, that's what I, you know, that's how I think about this. Um, next up is going to be Joe followed by Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there is uh, an element of look at yourself and see if you're polluting that river. But number two is that um, bringing awareness to it. Uh, and, uh, you know, that expose people to what they have lost, I guess. I think that that's the most important thing. Um, if you're really looking to, you know, galvanize certain a certain movement. Um, one thing that I had spent time in a very highly polluted country for a couple of weeks, and it gave me a huge appreciation for the um, environment and of itself. So I think by demonstrating what has been lost is a critical way of getting people to bring, getting them aware as to what is you know possible or what you know uh, the the pearls that are along with you know uh, pollution. Thank you. Uh, next up is John. Yeah, this is a really tough one because um, on one hand, there's a personal responsibility aspect of it and there's also a societal aspect of it and that we sort of live in a society just by the net sort of the systemic way that we live contributes to, to the situation sometimes. And a lot of that time it's out of our control. If we live in a modern industrialized Western country, there are things that are supporting us that we have no control over that are just doing you know terrible things to the environment so i think the first step is uh i think very stoic in its way and that sort of learn to develop good habits learn to be responsible yourself become mindful of like what where your money's going what you're doing and even if it's just a symbolic gesture even if it's just like not littering or maybe not buying that gas guzzler I think that has an effect. I feel like there's also a, a social osmosis effect by the way you act that affects those around you. So for instance, the same thing goes with civic engagement. If you vote and you happen to mention to your friends that you vote, they're gonna be more likely to vote. And I think it's the same thing with environmental. So I, I would not underestimate the aspect that you have indirectly as just a being 
your actions, your effects on other beings without directly communicating it. Okay, um, so Roger and Claire, um, we can either do two more questions, three more questions or four more questions and then go to breakout rooms because I want to keep, I want to do a full hour of breakout rooms divided into 15, four 15 minute segments. Um, so that's, that's what I'm planning to do. Would you guys prefer two questions, three questions or four questions? I think two is enough. I'll, I only have okay. one other one for me, unless sure. Claire has a couple that she would like to throw yeah. in. I'll do one. Okay, so one, one each. So Roger, go ahead. Yeah, and this last one's kind of more personally for me. It was a really good and uh, question and response. Is what shall I what shall I say to my faithless brother? Okay. Anybody? I can also right. answer how, this how, one first. How, yes, please go ahead. I acting it, actually. It, yeah, because I was going to say, it's, it's this idea that what do you say to the person that's completely lost hope? Um, and P Peterson has a really good answer because he says, the king of the damned is a poor judge of being. And it's kind of similar. It's the idea of recognizing that those that have lost hope tend to not be good sources for advice or good, good sources for information in general, right? If you're in a fully nihilistic pit or if you don't see any point to life, you sh it's important to recognize that it might not be the, you know, the truth or reality that you're witnessing, but rather a complete lack of meaning and lack of uh, rationale for your own existence that causes you to not be able to appreciate the everything else in life that exists. Uh, thank you. So next up is going to be kayaking. Uh, let me see, kayaking, Chachi, Joe, uh, and Mamta. Uh, kayaking, go ahead. Um, try to be a model. For them to see as a model of hope. Thank you. Um, next up is Chachi. I, um, I think you have no way of knowing what people around you are thinking, so you should just say hi and maybe they'll tell you. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Joe followed by Mamta. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with kayaking and I'm just going to come back to the same thing. It's just not uh, to not judge them and to uh, let them know that they're not alone. And I think that those are the two things that you actually can do to uh, um, be there for anyone. Thank you. Pegor has found multiple uses of the pen of light. He says, give them your pen of light. Uh, so it's a multiple, you know, one tool that fixes many problems. Next up is going to be Mamta. So, uh, well, I guess someone covered it already, deeds, uh, not the words. So I will do that. And also a big hug, always, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mamta. Next up is Deborah. Okay, yeah, I feel like I'm kind of saying what other people said in other words, but kind of like be the sunshine when you can, I guess. But also I think it's important to look out for yourself because I think it can be draining and Definitely try to offer people emotional support without like too much judgment if you can. But I also know, like I said, how much it can be kind of difficult to be like stuck down to. So I guess if you can do both. Wonderful. Um, all right. So next question by Claire. What shall I do with a fallen soul? All right. Okay. Aaron, you're first. Well, I think it's important to assess whether that soul wants to be saved. You know, we, we, we jump in there saying like, all right, let's, let's save this person. And there's a lot of people that want to be saved. They want to grow and they want to help, but you don't want to waste all your energy into somebody who doesn't want to change. Or maybe they're happy being a fallen soul. You, you, you never know. So I think just first assessing where their soul is at and, and then taking the appropriate ac uh, actions because you don't want to waste your time on somebody who doesn't want to change. Okay, next up is going to be Mamta. Mamta, go ahead. 
Okay, so I'm repeating. It's like recognize that the person is self-destructive or the, you know, the fallen soul. You just can't change them. It's sheer wastage of your energy. Leave, move on. That's it. Thank you. Uh, next up is Maxine. Run from them before they pull you over the cliff. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Next up is a uh, Joe. I mean, I'm I'm just going to build off of what Aaron had said. You know, it's not to jump in and save, but it's to let them know that you'll be there if they want, if they so choose to be safe, so so to speak. Um, so I I think that it's not to impose your will at all, but to appreciate where they are and and let them know that you'll be there if they so choose they need, they would like your help excellent so what we're going to do uh next is we're going to do breakout rooms what we'll do is that i'm going to do three short breakout rooms of 15 minutes and then we'll come together so that will be uh let me see that will be around 11 15 and then we'll do 15 minutes takeaways and we'll end at uh 11 30. that's that's the plan um all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and start the breakout rooms now.